Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. This has been created for those of us that love radical women who live perhaps by the rules, but also question and challenge the status quo. We want more from our lives, to enjoy our sexuality, to explore radical thought, and to celebrate women who have lived and continue to live unconventional lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Baer, sexologist, educator, activist, and definitely a radical woman. Thank you for joining me as I share stories of women challenging the status quo and living life to the fullest. Join me as we unapologetically march to the beat of a different drummer together. Honored to have Viola Johnson leather woman, activist, and motivational speaker who has been active in the leather, kink, and fetish scene for well over four decades. Vi is a proud member of the Onyx Pearls and is one of the original pearls of Onyx. She has received numerous honors for her work. Vi is the author of two books, Damn Fire, Child of the Blood, and To Love, To Obey, and To Serve. Vi has written for numerous magazines and newspapers over her decades of service to her tribe. Stay tuned and find out why Vi Johnson is the inspiration behind this podcast and why she will be an ongoing guest on this program. So Vi, welcome again to the Radical Rhythm podcast, Uh, my favorite reoccurring guest to talk about the history of radical women in, well, all over the world, not just in the United States. So thank you so much for for, um, coming on today. And Vi, can you tell us, our, our topic today is Monique Van Cleef. Who is Monique Van Cleef? Tony, you want to talk about radical women. Once upon a time, dinosaur, well, you know how that story goes. Monique was a woman in who was raised in Europe, Amsterdam or the Netherlands and around there, who ultimately came to the United States and became, or she was a professional dominatrix in the 50s and 60s when this was unheard of. Um, having studied psychology during nursing. She was a professional nurse and ultimately ended up delving into the human mind far more than the body. And understood that the desires that make us sexual animals are all kind of natural. And instead of going down the conventional means, she started delving into kink. Ultimately, a lot of things brought her to the United States. And in the 60s, she became a professional dominatrix when there were probably only a handful of pro-doms in the entire United States with an incredible client base, a lot of wealthy men, a lot of politically um, powerful men, corporate heads, and so on. And she always looked at what she did as a kind of therapy. Well, this very interesting therapy, which is also, by the way, the way a lot of her clients looked at it, I found that out because ultimately I got to meet another, a lot of them, but that's another story. Uh, Her therapy ultimately triggered some very interesting and curious people, some of whom were the New Jersey police, specifically the Newark, New Jersey police, because she owned a home on the Newark Belleville border, a rather large home, very nice middle class neighborhood, but an awful lot of cars that shouldn't have been in that neighborhood were suddenly appearing. And uh, at one point in time, she started writing for a publisher about the things that made us sexual animals and the exploits she was having with some of her clients. 
It's just that those things could be considered porn, pornographic if they landed in the wrong city, remembering the community standard. Well, ultimately, she ended up being arrested or busted, as we say, in uh, December of 1965. And that bust made international scandalous headlines. Wow. Okay, let me stop your story here. We'll get back to that. If we go back, we're looking at the 1960s. How does a dominatrix, a handful of them, operate? How do they get clients? Well, um, remembering that the kink SM community was a much smaller and the playground, I guess you could say, the domain of wealthier people, many of whom knew each other. And finding someone who understood the needs that was more than just in the missionary position for the purpose of procreation, finding someone who understood that was rare and if you had those desires you were probably talking to friends who had similar desires so it was word of mouth mostly i i just can't picture a person talking to another person just disclosing their sexual interests that are not conventional to another person but somehow that was done uh let's take a quick trip back to the 1700s a woman named Elizabeth Berkeley, the one who created the Berkeley horse in London. Yes, she was a London prostitute who realized that a lot of her clients um, developed fetishes while they were in boarding school. She was flogging the wealthiest men in London, not so much because they happened to all have been wealthy, but because most of them came out of the same boarding school, which was Eton. And one son of Eaton talked to another son of Eaton about the fact that there was someone who was willing to do this. Gotcha. So Berkeley that... became a wealthy woman. So there's a long history of this. If you're moving in the right social circles, most of you know each other, and many of you share the same picadellos sexual preferences you may at some point in time have shared the same partners okay i was just trying to get my head around monique van cleef actually having clients in new jersey are we in jersey at this time new york mm -hmm. she was in new york um made a small fortune from her apartment um uh, and then bought a house in new jersey all right. And you said there were so many cars going in and out of the house in, the, in a residential neighborhood, and that's what brought the attention where it, she ends up getting arrested. was the kind of cars. In an area that should have had Chrysler's and Buicks, there were an awful lot of Mercedes and a few stretched limousines. And, uh, you know, they just didn't belong there. Okay, so she was arrested for pornography. How, tell us more about that. That's where you were in the story before I interrupted you. She ultimately was charged with pornography. They tried to arrest her on a lot of different things. They tried prostitution. It didn't work. It, the charge didn't stick. Um, they tried actually assault that one didn't quite stick, although New Jersey's assault laws are actually fairly, or were fairly strange. Um, ultimately, they ended up charging her with, I guess it would be shipping pornography across state lines, because she was writing for a publisher. And ultimately, I believe they were both charged. Um, because the column that she was writing in his magazines and newspapers 
wasn't uh, legal in every state of the union. You know, it did not meet the community standard. So ultimately the charge that stuck was pornography. And those that are listening to this broadcast that are unfamiliar with magazines and uh, the written word that has a pornographic kind of uh, theme to it, um, this is not new in the 1960s. No. When we go back in time, I, you have a rare book room at the Carter Johnson Leather Library. Uh, how far does that go back? How far does the written word talking about s and m go uh far far farther than i can afford the books for uh, we're talking about at least a millennium probably farther those wonderful gilded manuscripts by monks also had an awful lot of sexual information in them uh, so it, it goes back a ways, not just in the written word, but in art and so on. Uh, you can find art in Italy that goes back at least 2,000 years, art on Greek plates dealing with flagellation and paddling and so on that goes back 3,000 years. What we do isn't new. So when I, when I saw the books in your rare book room, they go back, I saw, to the 1700s. And so Monique Van Cleef, the idea of writing about her exploits in a magazine is not that bizarre for the 1960s because it's been happening for hundreds of years before then. Yeah. Um, some of the early work, and we can go back to the very early 1900s just in the United States. But the issue for what was called the community standard, which actually could be a whole different podcast, um, and what was legal to send in the mail, was such a dangerous issue because what is what wouldn't bat an eye on the East or West Coast would be considered scandalous somewhere in the Midwest. So depending on where the letter got routed through its many uh, postal distribution centers on its journey, where the letter stopped could be where the letter standard got held to. So if the letter was routed in nowhere, Iowa, writing something as simple as, uh, you know, he held me down and think of Barbara Cortland novel might be considered scandalous by that community's standard. So the case with Monique is Monique Van Cleef versus New Jersey. Yes. And it's all over mailing pornography, they, they called her writing. But in doing so, um, magazines, newspapers, oh my God, hundreds and hundreds of hours of news time all over the United States exposed this, quote, seedy underground world of sexual exploitation, close quote, to a community, to a world that unless you were part of it, really didn't know it existed. You know, we're talking 60 years before Fifty Shades. Maybe 70, now that I think about it. So this was scandalous of the time. Ah, uh, on a scale of one to 10, scandalous is in the negative. This is, oh my God, the pearl clutching stuff for the 60s because uh, it wasn't something that wasn't whispered about. It was something that was really unknown. You're exposing the in the missionary position for the purpose of procreation only crowd to something that they could never have imagined and because the imagination got titillated rattled and scandalized probably all at the same time uh the case just kept getting brought up or the arrest originally just kept getting brought up before the news and monique who was 
uh, very much the stand her ground woman simply didn't back down. She was who she was, and she pretty much wasn't ashamed of it. Right. And you actually met Monique Van Cleef. Um, she became essentially the uh, leather grandmother to our household. We met her after, after the bust and after the trial, she went back to Amsterdam, which is where she was from. She's a Dutch citizen and was there until 1982 when she came back into the country. Uh, the woman that I was serving was introduced to her because someone who was serving her had 20 years ago been a good friend of the Baroness. Uh, Baroness because she married a Baron who then, as she put it, was nice enough to kill himself in a racing accident. Uh, I didn't say that, she did. And we got to know her. The woman that I was serving decided that wouldn't it be nice to have a small party for her to welcome her back into the country since the house that Jill, Catherine, and I owned was actually only about five blocks from the house that the Baroness owned where she was busted. Um, the friendship grew. The party list got pretty much out of control pretty quickly when everyone found out that she was back in the country. And uh, it was quite a party. And uh, what kind of things happened at this party without getting too graphic because not everyone in our audience um, um, appreciates the uh, SM lifestyle. But I think it's important to try to paint the picture of what it was like to run in these circles. Uh, Tony, it wasn't so much that the behavior was scandalous at the party. It was fun and it was light. It was a welcome back party. Part of what made it so fascinating was the, the people who came. Uh, the guest list read, ultimately read like a who's who. Rob of Amsterdam flew in. Um, Marco Vasi, the young writer, Marco flew in for that. Um, uh, there were representatives there from uh, a couple of European magazines who all came in. The New York social scene was all there. Uh, the owners of a lot of the New York clubs uh, there is a photo of a very young Annie Sprinkle who was at the party with um, the Baroness. V.K. McCarty, who that year, as a matter of fact, published the first ever article that was done on SM for Penthouse. And then ultimately went on to create variations. V.K. was at the party. I mean, the list of, of people there was just amazing. Uh, it was a fairly social party, a certain amount of titillation and scandalous behavior, nothing, you know, that you would have thought of for basically an evening cocktail party in New York or welcome back party. There were a few demonstrations. There was uh, a friend of ours who happens to have been a bullwhip expert who did back in the days when bullwhip acts in nightclubs were common did a demo of, you know, taking out cigarettes and, you know, uh, there were hot and cold running TV maids, but it was the interaction and the social interaction of artists and writers and painfully wealthy people who all knew the Baroness. So she went to Europe for like um, 15 years or so. Give or take, um, yeah. Was she escaping the law? I mean, the, <laughs> did she win the court case or did she lose the court case? Ultimately, she went to jail. Um, and uh, depending on who's telling the story, a number of her clients managed to have the sentence shortened on the, I believe it was on the grounds that she leave. 
which ultimately she did. Uh, and the state still didn't get what they wanted, which ultimately was her client list. Who were these people who were disappearing into those houses, that house? Who was getting out of the cars that some had diplomatic plates, some had corporate plates and so on and so forth? She never revealed her client list. Um, they found, or she, that's, they found the list. They didn't find the names because her clients were coded. So they never knew who client 12592 or whatever was. So they never really got to put it all together. Now, a whole lot of them, as I learned at that party, knew each other. And they were incredibly grateful that they had never been exposed. But uh, they got her out of the country before that risk got uh, stretched to its breaking point, so to speak. Right. So she, she was found guilty. She did some jail time. What would you say is the significance of her story? So what? First, in, there are so many things, Tony. First and foremost was finally bringing SM to light. Uh, not backing off of who she was, what she was, what she did with her clients and the fact that A, the behavior was normal. The behavior was therapeutic to some extent. That the sexual drives were fine that in many ways, meeting the sexual drive was far more healthy psychologically and emotionally than denying it and letting the drive um, make you ultimately destructive. And all of this and so much more came out uh, in the case itself. And then ultimately she went on to publish a book behind it. The book was called House of Pain. And not only did she talk about her life and her upbringing and you know, becoming a nurse and the long story that got her to the point of being a pro -don. She talked about her views about being a professional dominatrix and what it meant that it wasn't pain for pain's sake or it wasn't abuse. It was, if nothing else, a kind of sexual theater. And that that sexual theater led to healthier and more wholesome behavior. And in standing up for that, it forced a number of things in the state of New Jersey. One, it made them redefine or take a better look at prostitution. It allowed good conversation about SM. Um, it created an atmosphere that while it was still kind of scandalous, it was no longer hidden and forbidden. And all of those things created, led to, while we were still underground, and when I think of New York, I think of New York, but it led to us being freer in terms of creating an atmosphere for ourselves that was more than just the hidden private party. It allowed the SM nightclub of the 70s, like Club O or Paddles, uh, even Hellfire. And it said, we're here, we're okay. And that was the gift she gave us by being willing to stand up and not kowtow to the pressure of the media or of the courts. And she paid a pretty hefty price for it. You know, jail is nothing to sneeze at. Right, in New Jersey. Um, and, and being exiled for a period of time, I. And it sounds like it was, you know, not what she wanted to do, that she did that to escape all the pressure and to protect her clients. And it's a beautiful story of when she returns and the party and 
and the appreciation of so many folks for the sacrifices that she did make. So she, I, is a definitely a radical woman, I would say. She um, lived a lifestyle that not many did, especially publicly, maybe non-consensually publicly. Um, but she also, her impact and her voice and her book lives on in the hearts and minds of those that knew her and those that read her book and are inspired by her. And I have one story that I have to tell you. Because Monique was very, 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 very minor royalty, but she did marry into a title. When she came back into the United States, she came back under the auspices of, of the embassy. And uh, it was something we played up because we wanted to treat her like gold when we threw the party. Now, as it turned out, the embassy notified the police that, you know, she was coming, this party was being held because we blocked off the street for this. And the street we lived on was a major thoroughfare uh, because we had hot and cold running lim limousines going. But the embassy requested a police escort for her. Two of the police that arrested her 16 years before were her escorts that night for the party. Wow. So they are now having to escort a woman they arrested all the way because they stayed with her the entire night in an SM house at an SM party. And my how times have changed. The irony, right? The irony. Vi, thank you so much for the history, for the stories, and the time sharing um, your knowledge, your heart, your mind. I always look forward to your appearances on the Radical Rhythm podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Tony. Thank you for listening to the Radical Rhythm podcast today. It has truly been my pleasure to invite guests and talk to you about my passion the joy in our sexuality, and radical women who march to the beat of a different drum. If you'd like to work with me, Dr. Tony Bear, I have a community where I give seminars every month. I also have a coaching program, both group and individual, and also a course, a self-directed course, because it's all about experiencing the joy life has to offer. I'd love to work with you. Check out my link below, www.tonybearedd.com. I'd love to see you next week for another broadcast. And don't let anyone dim your shine.